Welcome to What Your GP Doesn't Tell You, the podcast for both doctors and patients with me, Liz Tucker. This week, I'm talking to NHS consultant, allergist, Dr. Sophie Farouk, who was the first national trainee in allergy in the UK. I was really interested to talk to Sophie because I think allergies and allergic reactions are one of the most puzzling fields of medicine. And one of those puzzles is why, over the last few decades, there's been a huge increase in different allergic conditions. So what's changed in our health and environment to bring this about? And what determines why one person becomes allergic to a substance and someone else doesn't? For example, peanut allergies were almost unknown when I was a child, yet now it and other food allergies seem much more common. And Sophie reveals the best thing to do to stop a child developing a food allergy is actually to ensure that from an early age, perhaps counterintuitively, they are exposed to a wide variety of foods rather than trying to exclude certain food groups. Sophie also discusses how children with eczema are at increased risk of developing a cascade of other allergies and what parents and doctors can do to minimise this risk. She reveals why many people who think they have a food allergy actually don't. And how, if you're allergic to one cat, you will probably be allergic to all, but why that's not necessarily the case for dogs. Cat allergen, it turns out, is one of the most powerful found in the animal kingdom, and it's remarkably resilient, because amazingly, it's even been found in the Antarctic. But before we get to Sophie's interview, a brief request from me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to leave a review on Spotify or Apple, that would be much appreciated. It really helps. You can also become a paid supporter of the podcast at patreon.com slash what your GP doesn't tell you or via PayPal on my website, what your GP doesn't tell you dot com. A huge amount of work goes into both the research and production of this podcast. So even a small amount of money makes a huge difference. And you can find out more information about the pod on my website where you can sign up for the podcast mailing list. Follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker and on my Substack account, liz.tucker.substack.com. Many thanks. And now back to Sophie's interview. Dr. Sophie Farouk is an NHS consultant allergist and today she works as the clinical lead in adult allergy at the Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. She's a long-standing member of the BSACI's Standard of Care Committee, which writes national allergy guidelines, and is also a member of the BSACI Council. And two years ago, wrote her first book, Understanding Allergy, published by Penguin Random House. Here's her interview. Hi, Sophie. Thanks so much for joining the podcast today. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I think possibly the greatest puzzle in understanding allergies is why there's been such a huge increase in different allergic conditions. What's your explanation? So, you know, I think it's impossible to say exactly why. If there was like a single smoking gun, a single explanation, you'd have found it. So we know it's complex, but our understanding has come quite a long way. And I think of it as different layers. So the first layer is our genes, which we will get from our parents. And if you have one parent who has an allergy, you've got probably around a 30 to 50% chance of developing an allergy. So for example, my nephew and niece, they both have hay fever and dad's allergic to grass pollen, mum has no allergies. If both parents are allergic, then the risk goes up to around anywhere between 60 to 80%. So part of it's our genes, but our genes are also influenced by our environment, which can lead to people tripping over into getting allergic disease. The second layer, just very specific to hay fever, is we know that as our climate has changed, and as generally our temperatures have got warmer, the pollen season has become around three to four weeks longer. And the concentration of pollen, this has actually increased by around 20%. So when I started out in allergy, patients would say, oh, a year was a good year, or they would say it was a bad year. And now for many of my patients, they just say every year is pretty much bad. So when it comes to hay fever, we know that the climate and the warmth is playing a part. Coming back to kind of all other allergies, I suppose the third layer are actually the trillions of bacteria and viruses and fungi which live inside us. And these make up about three pounds of our, our body weight. 
the microbiota. And more recently, we've come to view the microbiota as this sort of invisible body organ that educates our immune system how to fight an infection. It educates our immune system and teaches it what is good and what is bad. And if that interaction goes wrong due to the balance and type of bacteria, then we can become more susceptible to allergy. And I think one of the most powerful studies supporting this was actually a study in 2021, where they looked at parents and they looked at what they did if the baby's dummy fell on the ground. Did they, you know, lick it and put it back in? Did they rinse it in water? Or did they use an antiseptic agent? And they found that if the baby's dummy was repeatedly cleaned with an antiseptic, then there was an increased risk of food allergy compared to if no antiseptic was used. Presumably, that's due to chemicals in the antiseptic affecting the microbiota. More recently, we know that very young children, say infants, who are given proton pump inhibitors, which are medications which block stomach acid. Again, there's been an association between the use of those medications and a six-time increased risk of food allergy. So we're more and more aware that things that we do, things that we might come into contact can influence our microbiome, and that may skew us towards allergy. So that's sort of the third layer. And then I suppose that the final layer is, is when and how babies are exposed to foods. We know that, you know, for a long time, we used to advise parents of children, don't introduce foods that may cause allergy. So for example, the advice was, look, avoid, for example, giving peanuts to children until they're three years of age. And what we know now is that if infants are fed those same foods early, it can protect against food allergy. So there are kind of ways in which foods can come into contact with a young child. It can be that we're touching foods and it comes through the skin and that skin contact can potentially trigger allergy. But if you get those same foods into the diet early, then potentially that can induce tolerance and the, and the child doesn't become allergic. So probably some of it's to do with when and how very young babies are exposed to foods as well. But why is it, do you think, Sophie, that peanut allergies are so much more common? When, when I was growing up, I don't remember anybody in my class at school having a peanut allergy or it being an issue for children at all. I mean, I think that pre-1990s, peanut allergy was so rare that barely any data was collected. You know, you're completely right. Now it's so common that most schools across the land will have children with peanut allergy. They estimate one in 50 children are affected. There's been an increase in food allergies, and actually that applies to all food allergies. So people are often surprised to hear that the commonest cause of severe allergic reactions in younger children is milk. Allergy to milk or allergy to eggs, egg allergy can sometimes be less severe, is far more common than allergy to peanuts. But you're absolutely right that there has been an increase in food allergies, and that's all food allergies, actually. And what happens to our bodies, Sophie, when we have an allergic response? So allergies, they occur when your body's defence, so your immune system, essentially it's, it's viewing a substance as harmful and it's overreacting. It's having a complete hissy fit about something that you shouldn't be reacting to at all. This usually harmless substance that your immune system is now treating as rogue. So, for example, grass pollen or peanut. Essentially, our immune system, it's absolutely amazing and it's highly developed and it's really effective at protecting our bodies from outside invaders and from viruses and bacteria and, and parasites. And when it works well, it keeps you safe and you barely notice it. But in the case of allergy, for want of a better word, it, it's made a mistake and gone into overdrive. So instead of realizing that peanuts or dust or thorns or pollen are completely harmless and you can ignore them. It treats them like an invader and it responds and that can lead to the very specific symptoms of allergy. For many of us, you know, we see the blooming flowers and the blossoming trees and we're like, great, spring has arrived. But for some people, it's a sign that the allergy season is underway and it can mean months of sniffing and sneezing and runny eyes because the immune system, particularly in the nose and in the eyes, is really sensitive. Or you may know that, you know, in the case of a food allergy, you eat something and you get difficulty breathing and you get hives and you vomit. So essentially, this is your immune system going rogue and going out of control, which is triggering these problems. And so our white blood cells get activated. So our white blood cells, we've got a, a cell particularly, which I quite like because it gives me a job and my patients won't like because it gives them JIP, called mast cells. And mast cells are little bags of histamine, really, which is the chemical that causes allergy. 
that's waiting to be triggered. And our mast cells might be covered in antibody to whatever we're allergic to. So say you're allergic to peanut, the mast cell is covered in antibody to peanut, and the peanut comes in like a key in a lock and it opens the cell and whoosh, bang, pop, an allergic reaction can start. And I was interested to see that you say that actually in your clinic, many of the patients who come in who think they've got an allergy actually haven't got an allergy at all. Absolutely. I mean, you've got this kind of paradox, haven't you? Because on the one hand, allergies are increasing, but on the other hand, far more people think they have an allergy than actually do. Often people have developed maybe hives, so like a nettle rash, or they've developed swelling of their face. The medical term is angioedema. And there's an assumption that the rash is secondary to a food allergy, but sometimes hives can just be hives and swelling can just be swelling. The other very common one is allergy to medication, for example, penicillin. When we get unwell, quite often, especially young children, can be prone to coming out in a rash. And if a child presents with a rash whilst taking an antibiotic, of course, and it's the correct thing to do, the doctor is going to say, look, this could be an allergy. It's best to stop the antibiotic. And that gets popped down in your notes. But we know that 90 to 95 percent of people who have a label of, for example, a penicillin allergy are not allergic at all. And as an allergist, to some extent, it's frustrating for me. I don't know if there's another area where we would tolerate, in a way, a 95 percent misdiagnosis or overdiagnosis rate. But how to solve that is trickier because you don't necessarily have the specialist to deal with that. So you're absolutely right. Depending on the area and depending on the symptom, many of my patients who attend turn out not to have an allergy at all, which can be a source of huge relief. But do you think if people feel that they've got an allergy when they haven't, that might partly explain what we see as an increase in allergies? I think that it's a really good point because kind of one theory is, are we just more aware of food allergies? Are we becoming more aware of it? But that's probably not increasing the diagnosis. I mean, it's difficult to pinpoint just how much food allergies have risen because probably three times as many people think they have a food allergy than actually do. So if you take people and you ask them, do they have a food allergy? Being able to trust that data is quite hard because food intolerance and food allergy can all be confused. But if you look at data from like multiple peer-reviewed publications, the kind of feeling is that the rate of food allergies worldwide has increased from around 3% of the population in the 1960s to probably around 7% in 2018. Gosh, so more than doubled. Yeah. And, you know, and I think the other thing that's quite telling is the UK has seen an over 300% increase in the number of adrenaline injectors prescribed between 1998 and 2018. So just in 20 years or so, there was an over 300% rise. So I think getting really clean data is difficult. And there is increased awareness of allergies. But also, when you look at the data from the publications and our prescription patterns, admissions into hospital, it seems likely that there is a very real increase in allergy. And as part of the complication, the way that allergy tests such as skin pricks and blood tests can be interpreted, because just because a blood test shows that you have antibodies doesn't necessarily mean that you're allergic to that substance. You know, it's one thing that I'm often asked, you know, how reliable are, are, are allergy tests? Is a positive test the definitive answer as to whether you're allergic or not? And the analogy that I give my patients probably in every single clinic is that allergy tests, they're not like pregnancy tests. They don't give clear yes or no answers. And the key thing is that the allergy tests have only real definitive value when you interpret them in conjunction with the clinical history. So if you've got a clear history and a positive allergy test, you can make a clear diagnosis. So let's give you an example. You go to your box of quality streets, and if you're anything like me, you like the purple one, and you take the purple one and it's a chocolate containing hazelnut, and soon afterwards your mouth begins to itch and you get a rash and it becomes hard to breathe and your asthma kicks in. And then you come and see someone like me and you have a positive skin test or a positive blood test to hazelnut. Well, the two halves match and you can confirm the diagnosis. If, on the other hand, I see somebody and they've had a positive test to hazelnut, but they can eat it just fine. 
then that positive test doesn't carry the same weight. And it might be, for example, because they're allergic to a tree pollen and hazelnuts come from trees. And therefore, you've got similar proteins in the pollen they're allergic to and the nut that you're skin tested to. So the important thing is not so much doing the test, but it's choosing which tests to do and interpreting them. And you want someone who's got expertise to interpret the tests. It's interesting, actually, because I didn't have hay fever until I was 35. And I went on holiday to Greece one year and we were staying out in this pine forest and my eyes just streamed for two weeks and came back to London and I had very mild hay fever following a couple of years and then it just went. And yet the test showed that I had an allergy to birch pollen, but it's never irritated me since. Yeah. And there's something that we can call, and this is where it comes to the interpretation of the test. So there's something called sensitization, which is the million dollar question in allergy where people have positive skin tests, but for some reason, they don't cross over into getting allergic disease. I mean, I like to blame it on the microbiome, but maybe I blame everything on our bacteria we're doing. And so sometimes people can have positive tests that linger after they've outgrown their allergy or they've lost their allergy. Sometimes they can have a positive test and not react at all, but may suggest that they're at increased risk of developing an allergy to something. So the allergy tests are incredibly useful, but the interpretation of them is critical. And all too often I come across patients who have had tests done as part of like screening or they've had tests done by someone who doesn't have necessarily the confidence to interpret them. And they have multiple positives and the patient's left wondering what should they do. And of course, not all allergic reactions will produce antibodies anyway. No, exactly. So there are kind of two halves to it because no test is perfect. And particularly blood tests, but sometimes skin tests, they are variable in how sensitive they are in picking up those antibodies, even in individuals who have an allergy. So the one allergen that will quite often be tricky for allergists, in fact, there are probably two, will be sesame and walnut. And often in people who are allergic to those, you might not have positive skin tests or you might have false negative blood tests. So one part of it is, is your test sensitive enough to pick up the allergen? But the other part of it is that sometimes, particularly when it comes to drug allergy, certain drugs might be triggering an allergic reaction in the absence of IgE antibodies. So there are two halves to it. Is the test good enough? And it might vary. So the skin test and the blood test to peanut is usually a lot more sensitive than that to sesame, for example. But also, sometimes you don't have those IgE antibodies. Now, one of the worrying areas for parents with children who have eczema is that these children seem to be at increased risk of developing other allergies too, which can then lead to a cascade of other problems. What can parents do to minimise those risks? So again, another really pertinent question. I think it's worth breaking things down slightly. So the children who are at the highest risk of developing food allergies are those with significant eczema by the age of three months, so really little ones. And by significant, what we mean is those children who are under the age of three months who require steroid creams to treat it. And that relationship breaks down at around 12 months. So if you don't get your eczema by one year, then generally we don't see a greater risk of food allergy. So I think that's the first thing to know to kind of reassure parents who may be worrying. It's really those children who develop eczema by the age of three months who are at highest risk. And when it comes to food allergy, we now know that that advice, it's certainly when I was training and I'm giving away my age now, but you know, the advice was, you know, to avoid those foods. Well, we now know that eliminating foods from a baby's diet actually increases the risk of developing an allergy. And we know that from incredible work done in the UK by Gideon Latt's group at St. Thomas's. So we know that eliminating foods may increase the risk of an allergy rather than reducing it. And we also know that mothers don't need to cut foods out from their diet during pregnancy. On a broad level, A very simple generic rule is that you want to have your child having a varied diet with allergenic foods from four to six months onward. The strongest data comes from peanut and also for egg. 
So there you've got research that shows that those susceptible babies, so those who've got eczema a few weeks after birth, where you're getting that red flag, where that child's giving you a warning that they may be risk of allergy, may benefit from early introduction of solid foods from four to six months. And if they're not already allergic, foods containing peanut butter, so you're not talking about giving the little baby a whole peanut, um, but smooth peanut butter mixed with pureed food or pureed cooked egg. And this introduction seems to train the immune system to calm down, accept the food once it's introduced. And once it's in, it's important to keep it in the diet on a consistent basis. Now, for those children who are not at higher risk of food allergy, then peanut containing foods and cooked egg can be introduced around six months. And for your listeners, the British Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, the BSACI, so if you go onto Google and you type in BSACI and you type in weaning guide for parents, there is free online access with a document. So you type in early feeding guidance and you will get detailed information. I think other tips to prevent allergies, so baby massage is a big thing, but you want to think about what you're massaging into your child's skin and certainly avoiding olive oil, a number of other natural oils, because these natural oils are probably more likely to disrupt the skin barrier. And if that natural oil happens to be a nut oil or almond oil, for example, then potentially you're rubbing an allergen into the skin. Try to avoid using antiseptics to clean a baby's dummy. And then my friend, Helen Broff, who's a pediatric allergist, she's got a big interest in allergy prevention and her sort of top tips, if you've got a little one with eczema, certainly wash your hands before applying the skin cream. So you avoid putting bacteria on your hands and food allergens on your hand into the pot and those sitting there and festering or rubbing food allergens from your hand into the child's skin. And that may reduce the risk of developing an allergy. So I think that we're understanding more and more about it. And I suspect if we were to speak in, you know, two or three years time, there'd be a lot more to add. But hopefully there are some tips that your listeners can take away. I remember one allergist saying to me, the best tip was to get a family dog. I mean, that would be great for all the kids who want to have a, have a dog. In terms of building up a healthy immune system and rolling in the dirt. Yeah, it's interesting. There, there's some evidence that in families where there is a dog, the child seems to be at lower risk of developing allergies. Now, again, I think it's a question of kind of breaking this down a little bit. Does the dog live indoors? Does it live outdoors? what kind of contact the child might have. Is the child hugging the dog and rubbing it and in themselves all over the dog and the dog's licking them? So I think if you're going to be having very strict barrier between yourself and the dog, the effect might not be the same. But it's so interesting because I think it kind of in a way highlights the fact that our microbiome is important and the way we stimulate our microbiome is important. And possibly close contact with a dog may lead to exposure to certain bacteria that stimulate the infant's microbiome in a way to reduce the risk of developing an allergy. So I hope I get a a kind of green tick from all those who own dogs and have little children. (laughs) So so if you can reduce the chance of a child with eczema developing food allergies, does that also reduce their risk of developing other allergic conditions such as asthma? So when it comes to that, it's harder to advocate for that because you don't have such a strong relationship and there isn't such clear evidence for that. So what allergy specialists refer to is something called the allergic march. So allergic diseases in children develop in a sequence. You often have eczema first, then food allergy. Hay fever may come a little bit later down the line and asthma tends to develop last. Now, Not every child who has eczema and food allergy will go on to develop hay fever and asthma, and some kids will develop neither. So other factors probably come into play. For example, you know, do you have a close blood relative who has hay fever? How much your eczema flares? So you can't definitively say, well, if you treat the eczema, stop the food allergies, you will prevent them developing other allergic conditions. You may do, but you don't really have such strong evidence backing that up. Now, one of the other issues of food allergy we touched on earlier, if somebody is sensitive rather than allergic to food, how do you ascertain that as a doctor? If an adult comes in to see you and says, I think I've got a milk allergy, for example. So 
food intolerances are, are much more common than allergy and they refer to a reaction that's not involving the immune system that the problem is really around digestion so intolerance to the milk sugar for example lactose is is very common in fact more people in the world are probably lactose intolerant than tolerant because people don't have enough of the enzyme called lactase to break it down in their gut and so when they drink a lot of cow's milk or they eat foods high in lactose so cheese and yogurts they struggle with digestion and they might develop an upset stomach or diarrhea and bloating so if someone's lactose intolerance they can often have some dairy but it might just not be too much and it might vary on the person somebody might not be able to have three skinny lattes in a day somebody else might struggle if they have too much butter and cheese and a bit of milk in their coffee so food intolerances they can be unpleasant but they're very dangerous when someone's got a food allergy it's a different picture you don't seem to have this dose response it seems to be much more that someone eats a small amount of the food and very quickly their immune system those pesky mast cells get activated and fireworks start so you can usually work this out from the history and if the problem is primarily digestion and the gut you can be fairly confident that you're in the territory of intolerances now i suppose one of the most common allergies of all is hay fever which for so many people can make the summer months a bit of a horror if you've got an adult coming in to see you with persistent hay fever what's your strategy so i think the first thing is to actually take a take a good history to make sure that there's a seasonality to their symptoms that's really important and then to try to if they're coming to see me usually they've had a rough time so do some skin testing and try to correlate what they're saying with the skin test we know that tree pollens come out in the early part of the year so by the time this podcast comes out we'll probably be in the kind of birch pollen season then may june probably july you're talking about grass pollen and later on in the year weed pollen So the first stage is always in allergy we love our history we love talking to our patients so take the history and then do the skin testing to try and link up the history to the skin tests and then look at the treatments the patient has tried and to come up with a personalized treatment plan and it's interesting actually the increasing awareness of nasal rinses mm. which a lot of people seem to find very effective Yeah you know it, it seems strange that rinsing your nose out with salt water reduces the symptoms of allergy but inexplicably it seems to and just for people that don't know basically you take a a squeezy bottle do a very other method and you shoot up saline solution up one nostril and it comes down the other yeah this became a thing again about probably 10 years ago and i find that it almost seems to me disproportionately helpful it seems to help so much for something so simple and you've got two types of saline rinses so you've got a sachet that you can put in in the bottom of a squeezy bottle then you put in cold water from a kettle i hate to add cold not boiling water or you'll end up with a different problem if you shot that up your nose so you squirt that or you can get some pre-diluted sprays which you can use to thin the nasal secretions and how does it work you know it, it's not clear so one theory is that it might thin the nasal mucus so it becomes less irritating and it may remove allergens that are lodged in your nose i think that one advantage of them is that if you imagine that you're putting moisturizer on and you're putting moisturizer on through your clothing well you know it's not going to work as well in the same way if you're using a nasal steroid spray to treat your hay fever and your nose is covered in snot the scientific term but your your <laughs> the, the spray is not going to necessarily actually reach the lining of the nose yeah so i will tell my patients look use a saline rinse 10 or 15 minutes before you use your nasal spray just to clear your nose out and to allow the nasal steroid spray to reach the actual lining of the nose so we don't 100% know why it works but particularly if someone for example they might be pregnant they don't want to use medication or well, there's studies that show that saline rinsing alone you know you can do this as many times in a day as you want to they reduce symptoms and it's a very nice drug free adjunct on that first step of the ladder well i've used it for sinusitis several times and it actually worked for me better when everything else had failed yeah i'm always surprised by how much benefit my patients get from it that i cannot 
as a doctor explain, but I can't deny their experience. So I strongly advocate for it. I don't have shares in any of these companies. I strongly advocate for it. I think it can be really powerful and really helpful. And I was interested to see you recommend uh, avoiding nasal decongestants. Why is that? So, yeah, you know, it's one of my bugbears. When you look on the shelf amongst treatments for hay fever, you'll have the nasal steroid sprays, which for me are the sort of hero drugs. And then you've got the nasal decongestants sat next to them on the supermarket shelf. And how is that poor consumer meant to know which is the right one? Because intuitively, if I had a stuffy allergic nose, I'd think, well, why don't I use a decongestant which will unblock me and I'll be able to breathe. And actually, if you use this for a couple of days, you will get that benefit. The problem is, if you use it for more than a couple of days, you can get rebound nasal congestion and blockage. So then you think, oh, I better use a bit more of the spray. And you can end up in this vicious cycle. The name for this is rhinitis. So rhinitis is inflammation of the nose. Medicamentosa, so rhinitis medicamentosa, which is inflammation of the nose caused by medication. But really, decongestant sprays are designed to get you through colds. They're not designed to manage your hay fever. I would definitely say avoid nasal decongestants unless you've got a cold or a flu, and then you might be using it for a couple of days. But you don't recommend the slow-release steroid injections? No, they work, but the problem is the side effects. So these are called depot steroids, so it's a slow-release form of the steroid. And one very popular one is a steroid called triamcinolone, and the trade name for that is Kenalog. And it's injected into your bottom and it's slowly released into the bloodstream. And it is really effective at relieving symptoms of hay fever. And it used to be commonly prescribed by family doctors, but it's fallen out of fashion due to the potential side effects. So if you're using it regularly, you can be prone to thinning of the bones, and it can also lead to permanent skin changes. And I remember dealing with one patient who, you know, worked as a driver and essentially had had years of Kenalog because nothing else worked and probably hadn't tried other medications in the correct way. And as a result of the Kenalog, he got thinning of his bones, he fractured his wrist, and he lost his job. So I would say avoid these drugs. If it's reaching the point where nothing seems to be working, and you feel like, gosh, I have to get that injection because things are unbearable, it's a sign you need to be referred to a specialist, rather than reaching out for the injection. And actually, one of the things that's been used for people with really severe allergies is allergen immunotherapy. Can you explain how that works? So allergen immunotherapy is interesting and it was something that was discovered again in the UK actually at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington where they did the first studies and what it involves is giving a potent extract of the pollen that you might be allergic to in industrial doses. So maybe two or three thousand times more than you'd be exposed to during the pollen season. And this can be via an injection or a daily tablet under the tongue. And this almost, without going too much into the immunology, gives your immune system a short, sharp shock. And it re-educates it and teaches it. It reprograms the immune system. So it actually kind of modifies the disease. And the immune system then no longer has the same level of reaction to, for example, a pollen. I mean, immunotherapy exists in many things, but pollen is, is the one that's the most widely used. So... It's a really great treatment, but when you're giving someone 2,000 times more pollen than they might be exposed to during the pollen season, that also comes with kind of potential risks and complications. So in the UK, if you imagine that there is a ladder of managing hay fever, well, for some people, it will be just as simple as taking an antihistamine. You've got the other end of that ladder, the top rung, you've got immunotherapy, and then you've got somewhere in between. What I would say is I passionately believe that most people who have hay fever, they do not need to suffer. When I was growing up, my mum had terrible hay fever and it blighted her summers. And when I was a kid, seeing her suffer, it blighted mine too. And, you know, I've got memories of being in the car and it's a heat wave with the windows up to try to stop the pollen coming in. I think that too many of us are too accepting in a way. And I think a lot can be done to manage hay fever. So for some people, it's just a slight irritation. But for other people, they really suffer and they have a very, very rough time because of it. And things can be done. And if you're reaching out for Kenalog, I think it's time to see a specialist to see what else can be offered. And I suppose another 
common problem can be the way people can react to things like house dust mites? Yeah, so you can classify allergies into different ways. But one of the ways that I view them is that you have allergens that are seasonal. So very much in the UK, you know, we have clearly defined seasons still or just about. So you've got your tree pollens, your grass pollen, your weed pollens. Then you've got allergens that can cause rhinoconjunctivitis. So that's inflammation of the nose and inflammation of the eyes. So runny nose, sneezy nose, itchy eyes present the whole year round. And the commonest perennial or year round allergen is house dust mite, where without being too disgusting, it's not actually the house dust mite that people are reacting to as much as the house dust mite poo. But house dust mite is one of the commonest causes of year round rhinoconjunctivitis. House dust mite lives on flakes of dead skin and they eat the dead skin and they go for a poop. And then we breathe in the poo and it causes, you know, runny, itchy nose, sneezing, sometimes itchy eyes, itchy back of throat. What's quite interesting about allergy to house dust mite is the highest levels. You know, if I was a house dust mite, where would I choose to make my home? Well, actually, it would be in a mattress or in bed sheets because this is where I've got a really good food supply because when we're lying in bed at night, flakes of our skin are coming off. So often people with dust mite allergy report worse symptoms at night and early in the morning. Not always, but quite often because the highest level of allergen is there. And just to add that if you are allergic to house dust mite, house dust mite are ubiquitous. They're present everywhere. So it's not a reflection of how clean you are. If we are allergic, then is there anything we can do to lessen the level of house dust mites that we have? Yeah, so there's a lot that you can do. Whether it translates into improved symptoms is a different matter. And I think you have to like housework. In fact, my patients with house dust might often quite like it because I say, ideally, they're not the one who does all this housework, but it should be someone who's not allergic who does it. So you want to focus on the bed and you want to focus on the bedroom. If your pillow is more than five years old, they say about 30% of the weight is house dust mite, house dust mite poo and dead skin. So you want to be thinking about if your bedding is quite old or your mattress is quite old, thinking about potentially replacing it if you can. Obviously, that's a major undertaking. Sure. If you can't do that, getting a dust mite protective cover. So you cover your mattress so that the dust mites is deprived of a source of food. And you want to think about, for example, hot washing sheet, washing pillows, washing duvets to wash the allergen out of them. So you can focus on the bed, you can focus on the bedroom and do all manner of things to reduce your exposure. The question is, can you get the levels down low enough? So you're thinking about, say, you've got clothes hanging in your cupboard. Again, that's a very nice place for a dust mite to live. Are you really going to be cellophane packing away your clothes over winter? It sounds a bit like painting the fourth bridge. Well, I think it depends. This is where I think allergy is very personalised. And you'll get some people who will be like, right, I really want to go for it. And I'm going to get rid of my carpets. I'm going to put wooden floor down. I'm going to get rid of my curtains. I'm going to put blinds up. I'm going to focus on my mattress, get new mattress, new pillows, new duvets. I'm going to hot wash. And there's a whole range of things that there's not time to go into to reduce the levels. And for some of them, that will be enough to reduce the levels down sufficiently that they don't react. But for other people, despite all of the effort, it doesn't necessarily translate into clinical benefit. What I would be saying is if you're minded to go down the route of avoidance, the place to focus is on your bed and your bedroom. Don't be like my patient the other day who'd done everything all over her house except for her bed and bedroom. Focus on your bed and your bedroom, but just to be aware that you don't have very strong data showing that if you get the levels down, you feel clinically much better. And that's probably because it's quite tricky to get the levels down. But in theory, if you can get the levels down low enough and you're motivated enough, it should help. So just listen to this. My pillow is definitely over five years. So if I weighed my pillow, then it should now weigh more than it used to when I first bought it. It should do. I don't know if there are any studies that show how much more than it weighs, but <laughs> yes. So another common allergy that people complain about is an allergy to pets. And interestingly, it turns out that the way people react to cats and dogs can be quite different. 
Yeah, so cats are the kind of allergen A-listers probably of the animal world. I mean, horses can be up there as well, but cats, at least eight proteins that cause allergy have been identified from them. And part of the issue is that there's a major cat allergen that's found in the cat's saliva and also secreted by various glands in the skin. And when a cat grooms itself, it's covering itself in its own saliva and by extension, this allergen. So as the saliva dries, the allergen basically vaporizes and it can stay airborne for days at a time. And cat hairs, it's it's interesting because it's not the fur that's the issue. It's more the saliva coating the fur. So cat hairs that are shed will be covered in the allergen. And cats, you know, they're curious. So they'll explore everywhere. They'll go everywhere. They'll rub up against their owners. So they're covering them in, in hair and in saliva and allergen. And so when you look at cat allergen, if you went to my clinic room, you'd be able to measure it, even though a cat's never been there. If you go to hotels or cinemas or aeroplanes, you'll measure cat allergen. Cat allergen has been measured in two places where cats have never been. One is the Antarctic, where cat allergen essentially was sticking onto clothing, and the other was measuring it in dust from the NASA space shuttle. Somebody has carried that cat allergen on their clothing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, on their clothing or on their shoes. It's everywhere. It turns out that if you're allergic to one cat, you're probably going to be allergic to all cats, but that's not necessarily the case for breeds of dog. Yeah, so often patients will describe, it's very interesting with a cat, they can walk into a room and even if they don't see the cat, they'll know that they're reacting to it. And there's no such thing as a sort of hypoallergenic cat, unless you can produce one that doesn't have skin and doesn't produce saliva and doesn't pee, it'll be very difficult to get a kind of low allergen cat. But when it comes to dog allergies, many more of my patients will say, well, I react to some breeds and not others. And the only way to really find out is to be exposed to it. So If you've got an allergic tendency, I would say think carefully about getting a dog. But if you're desperate for a dog, then spend time with the dog you've chosen. Cuddle it, stroke it, let it lick you. And if you've got no symptoms, you'll probably be okay with it. But if you start after, you know, several visits to the puppy itching or wheezing or sneezing, then you should think about an alternate pet. Now, I think perhaps what really frightens people when they think about allergies is an allergy that can lead to anaphylaxis when someone stops breathing, when they have an allergic response. And you say that it's a mistake to say that just because you only have a rash or a cough when you're responding to an allergy, that things may not develop further. Yeah, it's one of the sort of unsettling things, really, that almost every food allergy has the potential to cause an anaphylactic reaction, even if the symptoms aren't too bothersome. And it's very difficult to predict who's going to have a severe or potentially life-threatening allergic reaction. And I think many things will influence it. The amount of the food that you might eat before you realise that you're exposed to it. Often people who have food allergy have asthma. So if your asthma is badly controlled and the food allergy then basically kicks in and it starts triggering your asthma, that can influence it. How tired you are might even play a part. One of the kind of predictors is if somebody has a food that they might be allergic to and then they exercise afterwards, that may lower the threshold for them reacting. Not that I'm saying that people with allergies shouldn't exercise. So if you were diagnosed with a food allergy and your specialist says you need to carry an adrenaline pen, even if your reaction has been mild, you need to do so if you are having an an, an anaphylactic reaction. So that's a severe allergic reaction that affects your breathing or causes your blood pressure to drop. If you're covered in hives or your face gets puffy, that's not anaphylaxis. But if your breathing is affected or if you're coughing, that implies your airways irritated or you're feeling faint, then the first line treatment for that is adrenaline. And we always tell our patients, you know, don't spend time searching for antihistamines antihistamines won't prevent a severe allergic reaction. And actually, a good rule of thumb, if someone has a food allergy, is if they're thinking, do I need adrenaline? Actually, you probably do. You know, if you can't quite remember the whens in the house, if you think, gosh, do I need it? You're better off giving yourself the adrenaline and then calling for help and going to hospital just to be observed for a few hours than wasting time with antihistamines, which might reduce itch or they might take away hives. 
but they won't reverse the symptoms of a severe allergic reaction. Because I think there was a small study, I think it was 13 children looking at giving adrenaline within 30 minutes. Yep. So one of the things that we know when you look at those worst outcomes, which I've got to say are incredibly rare, you're probably more likely to have a car accident on the way to the allergy clinic than to have a life-threatening allergic reaction to a food. But the difficulty for our patients is that there's no way of predicting it. And food is something that you can't, unless you prepare it yourself, and even then, automatically control what you're eating. You know, you so you have to have a level of vigilance and it causes a lot of stress for people. What we do know is that one consistent factor when you look at worse outcomes, so life-threatening reactions or worse still fatal reactions, is a delay in the administration of adrenaline. Now sometimes someone will do everything right and it still won't reverse it. But generally there is a pattern. If you think you're having a life-threatening allergic reaction, so you're eating something, you start to cough, and you've got a known history of food allergy, you get very wheezy, or you start to feel faint or lightheaded, then you don't delay in using your adrenaline. And the other tip, if I may, I would give all your listeners is whenever we feel unwell, I think we have a tendency to take ourselves off to the bathroom. So whether you're feeling sick or whether you're just feeling a bit queasy or a bit lightheaded, and if you have an allergic reaction and you take yourself off and then that reaction progresses, then potentially nobody really knows where you've gone. So if you think you're having an allergic reaction and you think, oh, I might just go to the bathroom to give myself my adrenaline pen. Well, first of all, the adrenaline pens go through clothing. But secondly, if you are going to take yourself out of a social situation to a bathroom, take someone with you. So you're not alone. Well, Sophie, that's such useful advice. Thank you so much for talking today. I know allergies are conditions that affect so many people. So really useful. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Many thanks. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Hope you enjoyed the latest episode of the podcast. It will now be taking a short break and we'll be back on the 7th of May, 2024. And if you've enjoyed the podcast, if you could share it and leave a review on Spotify and Apple, I'd much appreciate it. It really helps. Many thanks for listening. Bye for now.